This is the Roller Coaster Podcast, and I'm your host, Lucy Q. Life is a wild ride. It has twists and turns. It's scary, exciting, and downright fun. So throw your head back, arms in the air, and come along with me for the ride. Life is like a roller coaster, baby, baby. I want to ride, ride, ride. Life is a journey filled with ups and downs, challenges and quests. But our negative thoughts, combined with our insecurities, can grow into anxiety. So how can we bring balance to our inner world? Joining me today is Stacy Boyer of Namastacy to chat about creating inner calm. Hi, Stacy. Hi there, thank you so much for having me today. A lot of people, deal with anxiety. And I think it's been compounded in the last 12 months. There's an extra layer that we're dealing with. For somebody that thinks they may be experiencing anxiety or know somebody that might be, how do you identify it? I think all of us have anxiety and sometimes anxiety could be healthy. It could propel us to try new things, do new things, speak, be in a podcast, write a book, whatever it is. But when that anxiety starts to override everything in your life and not enable you to do the things that you once loved, that's when perhaps it's time to seek help or learn certain tips and techniques to help through something like that. Is it typically, does somebody experience it? Is it a mental block or does it also manifest into a physical sensation? Absolutely. And I think anxiety, it's, is it, you know, is it a nature or a nurture kind of thing? Is it something in our genes? Is it something we've saw our parents experience growing up and it's just part of, you know, who we are, or is it something, you know, really within our genes, who knows? Um, but yes, it absolutely can be a physical thing, whether it's the sweaty palms and the perspiring, the racing heart, the inability to even kind of get up out of bed because it does sometimes go hand in hand with depression. Um, is it forming into social anxiety where perhaps it's concerning to leave the house? Um, are you, you know, headaches, all kinds of things can, can happen because of anxiety. Is it all because of what we're thinking? Like, are we doing this to ourselves when you're experiencing anxiety? Is this because of what you're allowing in from your outer world, it's then being channeled through your inner world and it's just something's not working? Absolutely. And that's where lots of times cognitive behavior therapy comes into play. Um, and what that really helps people do is kind of challenge those irrational thoughts because nine times out of 10, they are irrational thoughts and worry for example, if we're perseverating on something and worrying and worrying, I think it's like 98% of the things we worry about never really do happen. So yes, it's learning how to, number one, challenge your thoughts, reframe your thoughts, um, question your thoughts. We want to believe everything that pops into our minds because why not? We're smart. We, we should believe it. But the truth is we don't have to. We can question those thoughts. Um, also, a good tactic is, is this something that you would tell your friend? So for example, if you have a negative thought uh, and you, you tell yourself, I can't do this or, or whatever it is, if your friend came to you with that same thought or that same concern, what would you say to your friend? And why aren't we being our own best friend? Why aren't we talking to ourselves like our own best friend? So absolutely, it's learning how to change, challenge, reframe our thoughts to help through anxiety. And that's one of those things that we're really good at as human beings. And that's talking ourselves into problems. For sure. We, and so now it's so much easier to go the negative route, right? Why is that? Yeah, I was just having a conversation with somebody and they're like, why is it that we always notice the pain that we have and not all the things that don't hurt? Why is it that we always look at that one or two mistakes that we've made and not the thousands of things that we've done right. 
It's yeah. like we're pre-programmed to automatically find the bad things. I think that is true, but I also think that we can reprogram ourselves. I think with practice, if we, you know, for example, teachers are supposed to, when, uh, whenever they say something negative, perhaps to a student, they really are supposed to back it up with two or three positives. And it's like, why are we not doing that to ourselves? If we have a negative thought, well, let me see, can I back that up with two positives? So why am I thinking about the negative when I really have all these positives to back it up? And I, I also think that goes hand in hand with, um, uh, gratitude. And that's something, you know, when we're experiencing anxiety, depression, um, a really important thing is to wake up, however hard it is on a given morning, to wake up with gratitude, something we're grateful for, and then going to bed at night with something we're grateful for. And there is a study that if there's a possibility to do it throughout the day, just as you're walking outside, you know, saying something you're grateful for, nature, whatever it is, that kind of helps and um, kind of rewires our thoughts too. Gratitude can be difficult to start. It seems, I think this, the, the, when the movie The Secret came out, it really popularized gratitude. Mm -hmm. But it also, for me, I found it really challenging. Not because I didn't have anything to be grateful for, but because you kind of feel awkward. <laughs> Sometimes uh -huh. journaling about, oh, I'm so grateful that I, you know, I have eyes to see, I have feet to walk. It can feel a little bit awkward when you're, you're sort of diving into that, the minutia of things. So for me, I found it easier to be grateful for the whole, you Ooh. know, for loving relationships, for health and wealth. Because for me, I found it easier just to be more expansive with it rather than being you know, sort of niching down on, on what I'm grateful for. Yes, yes. You know, and perhaps someone that was in, you know, psychotherapy, maybe, which I completely uh, think everyone should. I think it's a wonderful tool, especially during these times to think that about pursuing therapy, whether telehealth or in office, but it might be interesting to question why, you know, um, why can't I just be grateful for everything and every little thing because um, I'm deserving and it's okay. And I think a lot of people think, you know, self-care or being grateful is like a selfish thing. You know, it's so silly and it's just kind of being selfish and maybe I don't deserve to, um, but truthfully self-care is not selfish and it's so helpful when dealing with anxiety too because lots of times we're anxious for the little reasons too you know for example are you getting enough sleep which is part of self-care are you drinking enough water um are you eating properly and that doesn't mean diet or anything like that that means are you making sure you're eating enough fruits and vegetables and exercising and all those kind of little things um, can help with anxiety, particularly the uh, sleep one, making sure you have enough rest. I can attest to that one because <laughs> I've gone through bouts of insomnia. And if it's, if I'm going through a stretch where I'm only getting three or four hours sleep a night, you can literally, I can, it's like, I'm seeing somebody else slowly lose your mind. Like you can feel yourself going a little bit loopy and I could recognize it and it's like, okay, no, it's just, you're tired. That doesn't exist. It's all these, these falsehoods that are coming up because I, I think there's, there's so much focus on, you know, diet and exercise, mm -hmm. but we forget to tie it in to, you have to have a healthy body to have a healthy mind. You have to be putting the right things in in order for your, whether it's your body or your mind to perform properly. Yes, yes. And I, you know, I hate talking about diet because obviously that's, that's not what I do, but it is true if you're not giving yourself the nutrients and I'm not talking about cutting out things or exercising and becoming a triathlete or any of those crazy things, but just making sure that you have the nutrients to make your mind work properly and making sure you are exercising. And if that's just a walk around the block, that's okay. But all those little things really, really help. And that's it. Is it, you know, often people think that to make a massive change in their life, 
they have to put in, you know, massive efforts. And I've actually found that sometimes just starting off with baby steps, you can start to have really good results. And that each little baby step, you're just building on top of what you've already accomplished. I mean, and I would actually say that you would probably have longer lasting results that way too. Um, and more positive results and more the ability to sustain it with the baby steps. But I also think it's important, you know, when we have a setback and we don't work out or we, you know, do some eat junk food, that's okay too. And I think that's part of self-care also, telling yourself, you're not a failure. This is okay. We all have good days and bad days. We just want to have a, some more good days than bad days, but it's okay to not be perfect uh, several days too. Yeah. And so often, you know, we bring up the 80, 20 rule and so many things. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, you know, I think it's helpful that we apply that to ourselves, whether we are talking about healthy eating, exercise, being mindful, anything like that is that if 80% of the time you're doing the, you know, you're making the right choices, you're moving in the right direction, that 20% when you're just, you just can't be bothered, you're doing your own thing. That's okay, because you have to have that balance. You can't be go, 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 go all the time, because that's going to create its own set of problems. Absolutely. Absolutely. And giving yourself that grace to know that it's okay. And also even, you know, sometimes we, we have triggers or things that set us off. And maybe even knowing when you're getting to that point where, hmm, I'm not going to be able to eat healthy today and exercise today and clean the house and do the laundry. Today is just not going to be one of those days. And that's okay. That's okay. And acknowledging that. Yeah. And being okay with not being okay. On those days that you don't feel 100% and you're ready to take on the world. That's okay. Absolutely. That's okay. It may last for two or three days. Keep yeah. doing what you're doing and then, you know, you'll get back on track yeah. and that's where, you know, you're, you're very, you're an advocate on mindfulness and visualization and meditation. So how does that all come into the picture to, to help our overall health? Well, I mean, similarly to what you said about the gratitude, how it's hard and it's a little awkward and weird. Um, I'm a big proponent for meditation and deep breathing, maybe first thing in the morning. Um, Not everybody is good at visualizing or they don't think that they are. And it can be hard and and meditation as well. Um, But allowing yourself maybe three minutes in the morning or the afternoon or the evening to do it and then building up from there. Um, and, and when I say meditation, it isn't necessarily just keeping a blank mind, but allowing that thought, maybe that negative thought, okay, it's there, like the train coming in the station, it's coming, okay, it's there, and now I'm going to let it go. Um, and some people can do that sitting on a mat or laying down and meditating, and other people have a hard time with that and prefer to do like a nature meditation or a beach walk meditation and they uh they the thoughts coming in their mind and there it is they acknowledge it and now i'm going to focus on a bird now i'm going to focus on the ocean or whatever it is and getting getting your mind out into something other than that stressful thought yes and meditation it doesn't have to be this big complicated thing it can be as simple as you said sitting on the front porch and just noticing the birds and just watching the birds interact and being lost in being lost in its own presence yeah because then your mind just it forgets everything else and then after a couple of minutes you kind of snap back in and you're like oh darn i gotta go make dinner <laughs> yes yes it's true but at least you have those those few minutes right yeah. and i think you know it's fun, not funny to me but i i noticed that people with deep breathing you know that's a huge part of meditation as well and so many people you know just talking about anxiety when you say deep breathing they breathe into their chest and that is you know, completely wrong and could exacerbate a panic attack or make you feel lightheaded or feel like you're going to pass out and that won't do you any good. So even before a meditation, taking that deep breath into your stomach and making sure that air fills your stomach and you 
hold it there and then breathe slowly out through your mouth. And I sometimes tell clients, um, you know, once you have that down pat and you're doing that not even during a stressful time, during a calm time. So when you are stressed, you can easily draw upon it. Um, but in a relaxed state, maybe breathing to your stomach, maybe telling yourself something positive at that point and then breathing through your mouth and maybe holding that little mantra or that positive little anecdote with yourself throughout the day to, to kind of take you back to that calm state. And it's the deep breathing that, and I, and I don't, I can never remember how this works, but it has something to do with it affects your vagus nerve. Yes, yes. It's it's connected to your vagus nerve with which if done correctly really does slow the heart rate. Um, it's, it's not this falsehood, it's a biological thing and it really does, uh, but it's doing it correctly. So breathing in through your nose, again, getting it in deep into the stomach, puffing the stomach out, nobody cares, nobody's looking, puffing that stomach out, holding it and then as slow as possible through um, pursed lips would be the best way. And there's, is there a difference in how long you breathe? Because there's different methods I've heard of. The one I use is I breathe in for four, hold it for four, and then release for longer than the four. I do it to a, a, a spoken meditation. So I, I time it with what they're saying. So it's probably more like an exhale of eight until you almost have nothing left in it. Does that make a difference when, you know, the timing or is it just more important that you are being mindful about your breathing? I think, I mean, there's so many different kinds and probably a yoga teacher would, you know, tell you one thing and somebody else would tell you another thing. There's also the chanting or um, the exhaling while humming that, mm, um, there's so many, the, the triangle breathing. So if, um, you know, perhaps with teens or, or younger uh, children, you know, visualize a triangle, breathing up to the point, holding it and down to the other point and, and you know, the whole thing or a square breathing up, across, and down if you're good at visualizing. Some people, um, if they really need a tactile thing, if, you know, using your hands, breathing up to the tip of your thumb, and then down, and up, and down. And that sometimes helps for people that get anxious, perhaps at the dentist or something, where their hands are kind of at their lap, um, or if they're at a dinner party and their hands are under a tablecloth, where they could kind of do it privately and deep breathe using their hands. Um, so there are all kinds of like little tactics that, that people can do um, when they need to deep breathe. So are there other visualization techniques that people can use? Yes, um, one that is excellent for anxiety uh, is grounding. And I think we've, we've probably all heard of grounding, but it really gets us back in the moment because when we're anxious, we're thinking of the future for the most part, the what ifs and the, oh my goodness, and uh, what, what, what in the future. When we're depressed, uh, lots of times we're thinking of the past. So the goal really is to be in the present. Of course, it's good to think of the future a little bit to plan for things, but when we're most happy, we're mindful and we're in the present. So grounding is an excellent way to keep us in the moment, especially if you're feeling anxious. So with grounding, again, I always start with a deep breath and then it's finding five things you can see right in your uh, vicinity, um, four things you can hear right wherever you are, three things you can smell, two things you can touch wherever you are, and one thing maybe you can taste or want to taste. And by using those, your five senses to ground yourself, you're now back in the moment. And for a lot of people, that really, really helps with anxiety. And that's something to practice too when you're not anxious, so you can kind of draw upon that when you are. And that's, I've never heard of that one before. So it's five things you see, four things you hear, three things to smell, two to touch, and one to taste. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and there's many other things people do for anxiety as well. A lot of people, um, you know, I have several clients or people that now that kind of the world is a little bit opening up, they're now anxious to go back into society in a way. Yes. Um, it's kind of, I guess, COVID. I think it's called what do they call it? Re-entry syndrome? Yes. I mean, I feel like a lot of people have sort of developed like a little bit of an agoraphobia where they're kind of scared. Um, and that's where uh, exposure therapy would help. Um, 
when they're ready. But a lot of people sometimes if they they enjoy holding a um, like a comfort object. And I know little children do that. They bring their stuffed animal with them for comfort, but adults do that too. You know, a stone, a crystal, a rock, whatever in their pocket or, you know, whatever their backpack. And when you're out, you kind of hold, put your hand in your pocket, you touch this object and you again, bring your mind to that object. So you're not thinking of all the other stressors. So you ask yourself questions like, okay, is it sharp or is it rough? Is it cool? Is it warm? You know, just kind of asking yourself questions about this comfort object in hopes that your mind will focus on the object and not, you know, your anxiety or your stressors. Because the, you know, call it the re-entry syndrome around COVID, it's real. Yeah. And I can see, and I'm in Canada. We're still, we're, we're, we're not out of this yet. They, they keep telling us we will be. Uh, I'm not, I don't have much faith in what's going on. And where I am, every time I leave my province, if I, when I come home, I have to completely self-isolate for 14 days. So I'm not even allowed off my property. I've done that. Now, the last time I did it was because my my kids came home from college. So we all had to self-isolate for the 14 days. And those first couple of days after quarantine and you leave your house, it's a little bit weird. Mm -hmm. And part of it is that one, you're sort of not used to being back out again. And that can happen. That happens after just 14 days. But it's also there's a certain amount of fear that people may find out that you were away or you had somebody come into your home and be blamed for, oh, you're one of those people. And, you know, you don't want to become a target. So I can see how, you know, if anybody has had prolonged you know, call it stay at home orders, or, you know, they've removed themselves from society for a period of time, I can see how that would really manifest into a much bigger problem. Absolutely. I mean, well, first, I really respect what your country is doing, because ours did not do that for a long time. And uh, we had a mess there for a while, too. <laughs> we have, <laughs> we have our own mess. <laughs> I mean, it's just ridiculous, but okay, now things are changing quickly here and some people, well, most states don't even have to wear masks anymore. So there's all of that. So then there's there's these people that are finally venturing out, but they're still scared. And now, you know, this one doesn't have a mask. It's, it's, it's very difficult. But um, something like exposure therapy is, is what would be recommended. And, um, and even if it's just stepping outside, uh, for example, I, I know somebody that is has this and is petrified, uh, but is willing to go to this grocery store and be the very first person there. So standing outside at 6.30 in the morning um, with her mask or double mask on, even though she's vaccinated and kind of being the first one in and getting one item and leaving. And that was her first kind of chore or thing that she did and she did it successfully. And then she gave herself another goal and another goal. And I think for a lot of people, just seeing that you can do it and it's okay and you're going to be okay and you're doing everything in your power that you feel is right. Um, you know, we can't control anybody else ever really, right? We wanna control people, but um, the truth is we can only control our own actions and we can only control our own thoughts. So that's what we have to do. Um, but exposing ourselves slowly is, is really the only way to do it. And whether we're talking about getting used to getting back out in the world or starting a meditation practice or being more mindful, it all starts with baby steps. And it's okay to fall off, get out of habit. You can always get back into it. How is it that you help people? How do you work with people to help them on their journey? Well, I, um, 
had a, a private practice in an office and now since COVID it's all um, telehealth, which was a big change and a big challenge because of course you don't see the body language and there, there's other challenges with that. But it seems to uh, be working really well because people are in the comfort of their own home um, if that is their safe space and they feel comfortable there um, or they're in their car or their backyard or, or wherever and it seems to be um, really going well. Um, and so I do a lot of uh, EMDR, which is for PTSD. I also do cognitive behavior therapy, talk therapy, um, visualization, mindfulness, meditation, all those things um, for, for my clients. And it seems to go, it seems to be doing really well um, with telehealth. People seem to really enjoy, although there are some people that, you know, want to be back in the office, but um, for the most part, it's, it's been successful. Yes, I think everyone's looking forward to, not everyone, most people are looking forward to that human interaction again, and actually being able to see somebody's face yes. when you're having a conversation with them. Absolutely. So what is the best way for people to connect with you, Stacey? Um, well, you could find me at my website, which is namastacy, N-A-M-A-S-T-A-C-I-E dot net. Um, I'm also on Instagram at namastacy underscore Boyer. And I have a podcast called Namastacy with little like prayer hands at the end of it. And um, on that, there's all kinds of meditations and uh, mindfulness and um activities and, and things to listen to for visualization or deep breathing techniques and all kinds of goodies. If you're listening and you're looking at connecting with Stacy, make sure you check out the show notes. I'm going to have all of her links in there. Thank you so much for joining me today, Stacy. And thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Roller Coaster Podcast. Want to chat or share your ideas about today's show? Pop me an email at hello at the rollercoasterpodcast.com. Don't forget to connect with me on Facebook and Instagram at The Roller Coaster Podcast. Our theme song, Roller Coaster, was performed by The Lucky Setback. Audio editing by the one and only Jeff Quigley of Quigley Creator. Life is like a roller coaster, baby, baby. I want to ride, 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 ride. Life is like...